So the big recordings just have the screen. Um, you can wander as you want, but the more in front of the computer you are, the better the audio will be. Okay. Like if you go out to that corner, yeah. I'm pretty attached to my yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Moving. All right, so I'm just going to try a little more. Let's see if he's on the back of that. Oh, cool. Can you send it to me? Yeah, it's here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, I think there's another chance here for that. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for coming to the Graduate Student Seminar Series. Uh, this afternoon's speaker is David Bertolatis, who did his undergrad, two undergrads at University of Iowa and at Metro. Um, he did his master's here and is now a PhD student um, in Dr. Vida's lab. I'd also like to welcome you all to the Vida Lab Week. Uh, Dr. Vida is the seminar speaker on Friday, so I feel like it's a week long celebration of this lab. Um, <clears throat> David's won several awards, including a GRFP honorable mention, um, the best student presentation at a Gordon Research Conference, um, and another award for presentation at the Rocky Mountain Society for Environmental Toxicology, Toxicology and Chemistry. Um, so we're looking forward to his excellent speaking. Um, he has publications in the journal Herpetological Conservation Biology and the journal of North American Herpetology. Um, and today he'll be talking to us a little bit about his PhD work, uh, assessing the effects of exposure to complex environmental mixtures using integrated organismal chemical and landscape scale analyses. Thanks, and please help me welcome David. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, so I got my comprehensive exam coming up at the end of the semester. So what I'm going to do today is kind of a hybrid talk uh, between the traditional data seminar and uh, proposal defense. So the first half will talk about the data that I have analyzed, and the second half talk more about my future directions for the rest of my PhD. Um, before I jump in, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank my co-authors on this work, Larry Barber at the USGS, Chris Martinick at the University of Florida, and of course my advisor, Alan Vida, here. Uh, this project is very interdisciplinary, very collaborative, and I wouldn't be able to do any of this without uh, these co-authors. So uh, my research focuses on better understanding the effects of exposure to complex mixtures of environmental contaminants. Give you guys a scope of this problem. The EP estimates, sorry, the EPA estimates there are around 30,000 synthetic contaminants that are currently in use in the U.S. and that doesn't include pharmaceuticals or pesticides, which are have a different regulatory framework. For a majority of these contaminants, there's really little or no toxicity data, so we don't know what the effects of exposure to these are. And even for the contaminants that we do have well-characterized toxicity data, um, that comes from individual contaminant exposures in a laboratory setting, whereas we know that organisms are exposed to complex mixtures of contaminants, and exposure to mixtures can be very different than exposure to individual contaminants. So here's a recent uh, national survey that was done. These guys measured over 700 different contaminants at 38 sites across the U.S., and they detected over 400 contaminants at at least one of the sites, and then at all of their 38 sites, they detected at least some anthropogenic contaminants. And this includes their reference sites, which they chose because they thought would be uh, relatively pristine. So given this problem, the main questions I'm trying to address are, what are the effects of exposure to these complex mixtures? And how much risk is there to aquatic wildlife? And then from there, can we um, get a little bit more precise? Can we identify specific contaminants that we think are contributing to this toxicity? And can we identify the specific areas on the landscape or the specific habitats that are most at risk from these exposures? All right, so that's 
that's a big problem there. That's a big complex um, system that I've identified here. We have thousands of potential contaminants in the water and those can affect hundreds or thousands of biological pathways at the organism level. So how do we really make any sense of this situation? Um, our approach to try and narrow down this complexity a little bit and get a little bit more predictive power over these systems is to look at landscape variables. And for now, specifically focusing on land use and asking can we use patterns of land use across the landscape to predict patterns of contaminant exposure in rivers. And then if we know what contaminants we're gonna find in these rivers, can we predict biological effects of the organism at the molecular level? Right, the idea behind land use is we know contam contaminants are used in specific applications that should correlate to land use in many situations, right? Agricultural chemicals like pesticides and synthetic fertilizers are used in areas with high ag land use. So if we can measure that variable, can we then predict what kind of contaminants we're gonna find here? So this is kind of the overall framework, kind of a large scale hypothesis we have for this project. And we use that to guide these other experiments that we do. Uh, we took this framework to the Shenandoah Valley in Northern Virginia. This is a tributary to the Potomac River and ultimately drains into the Chesapeake Bay. And it's a good microcosm for investigating these relationships between contamination and land use because it has a, a wide variety of land use within this one watershed. So we have highly agricultural areas, we have forested areas, we have medium and small municipalities, and some industry as well. So we have this variation in land use. And there's also a history of ecosystem impacts that have been associated with uh, pollution in these rivers. And a big part of that history begins with fish kills that started in 2002, where a lot of the smallmouth bass and other centrarchids uh, died off in mass in the spring. And those fish kills have occurred uh, sporadically until as recently as 2014. There's been a lot of research into the cause of these fish kills. They haven't identified any single smoking gun obvious cause, but exposure to contaminants is thought to play a role. And the evidence for that comes from very high levels of intersex where we have male fish, where the gonads are displaying uh, oocytes, expressing the oocytes of the gonads. Um, and that um, has led to a focus on estrogenic contaminants, right? That would be an impact we associate with exposure to estrogens. There's also signs of immunosuppression, as evidenced by I'm sorry, these external lesions uh, growing on the fish or in areas uh, with high levels of fish kills. And uh, research on these external lesions has shown a very high prevalence of opportunistic pathogens that are you know, generally present in the environment, but not necessarily that pathogenic. Um, unless the fish is stressed or immunocompromised for some other reason. Okay, so we go to the Shenandoah and we have uh, selected nine different sites over the course of three years. And we selected these locations specifically to capture unique land use characteristics of the surrounding watershed. And at each of these sites, we deploy these mobile laboratories and expose fathead minnows. So the mobile laboratory, we're actually pumping water out of the river into these head tanks up here that then flows into the trailer and into these aquaria. So this lets us capture realistic environmental mixtures that are present in the river while still maintaining a degree of experimental control here. So we can maintain the constant temperature between sites, we control the oxygenation of the water and the diet, and perhaps most importantly, uh, by using laboratory organisms, right, we have standardized their exposure history. We all know they were reared under the same conditions. And so we can expose them for short periods and compare effects that way. Whereas when you look at wild fish, you don't know that exposure history and that can be a big confounding variable. Uh, so the fathead minnows, commonly used species in aquatic toxicology studies. There's a, a number of molecular tools available for them. And we expose them for seven and 21 days. And we do uh, necropsies, samplings at those points. And we measure a variety of organismal impacts at each of those samplings. 
and seven at the organismal level, measure survivorship, and a somatic index, the number of nuptial tubercles. Molecular level, we do an ELISA to measure the concentration of the telogenin protein. And then my focus here um, is a lot on the transcriptome profile. So we use microarrays to measure genome-wide expression profiles. So we get data on over 22,000 unique transcripts in the genome. And this is uh, really valuable for mixture studies where we don't necessarily know what these impacts, these effects of exposure are going to be. It can be hard to select an appropriate targeted biomarker ahead of time. So this lets us get a very broad look at the physiology of exposed fish. Along with the biological endpoints, we perform a really rigorous chemical characterization as well. So we take groundwater samples every week during the exposure, and those samples are analyzed for over 500 different contaminants, things like steroid hormones, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, disinfection byproducts, focusing on organic emerging contaminants. All right, so this really represents the foundation of my dissertation, this integrated landscape, biological, and chemical data that we have. I'm going to address several different sub-questions using this data. So the first chapter of my dissertation is, is a, an effects assessment, where we really just characterize what happens to the fish following exposure, describe those impacts of multiple levels of organization, and we can then ask what are the effects and how much risk are there to these exposed organisms. And then we also view this kind of in a more big picture context as well. We're doing these effects assessments in the Shenandoah, but other research groups are doing similar effects assessments nationwide, so we can really get a good picture of what kind of chemicals are out there and what you know, impacts they're having on fish. Second chapter, um, and this, this first chapter here is going to be what I really um, talk about as far as having to analyze data. And these subsequent chapters are what I'm currently working on in future directions for the rest of my dissertation. So chapter two is a technical update of the FAD minnow microarray, but then we'll also use that update to look back and previous exposures that use the microarray and see what kind of data is there that might have been overlooked because of these technical issues with the microarray that we'll talk about. Chapter three um, is really looking to quantitatively link our genomic impacts to specific contaminants. So uh, we have these lists of chemicals that we know are detected at each site. Can we actually then identify ones that are more likely to be causally in, you know, involved in the exposure effects that we see? And then finally, chapter four gets back to this idea of the landscape framework and can we actually use land use landscape variables as predictors of either contaminant occurrence or of specific biological effects in our organisms? Okay, like I said, I'm gonna talk for a while now about what we've done in chapter one. And I'm gonna talk about our exposures from 2014 and 2015. We did another one in 2016. It's very close to being ready to present, but there's a couple of um, things that just need to be buttoned up before I'm really ready to talk about it in public. But anyway, 2014, we have four sites. We have a highly agricultural site on the North River just downstream of there, we have a wastewater treatment plant, and we have a site that's directly in the mixing zone between that wastewater effluent and the river itself. About 60 miles downstream of there, we have a site on the south fork of the Shenandoah. So this is a large mixed use watershed with some ag, some forested areas, and some municipalities. And then we have a reference site on Passage Creek in a largely forested watershed. Again, for our reference, we know this is not a completely pristine site, but we look at this as a baseline, minimally impacted site that we could use to compare these other potentially more impacted sites to and see what those relative effects are there. 2015, we returned to the south fork of the Shenandoah. We had another site on the north fork of the Shenandoah. So now in this year, we have these two large watersheds 
that really have relatively similar land use characteristics when we look at the whole watershed. And then we again return to Passage Creek as the reference site. Okay, uh, begin talking about some of the chemistry data. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here because it could really be a, a talk in and of itself. But I want to look at these overall contaminant profiles and see uh, what are the patterns really of the overall contaminant level. So we did a hierarchical clustering analysis for every chemical that was detected in one sample. And then we just used binary detect, non-detect data for this. We evaluate the strength of these clusters using this bootstrap probability values. And this represents, you know, basically like the significance of this cluster, or the probability that this cluster is truly unique in the data. And I refer to anything over 95 as a strongly supported cluster. And then anything over 80 is going to be a moderately supported cluster. So in 2014, we see that we get generally really strong clustering between these different sites for eggs and well-supported clusters, telling us that there are difference in the overall contaminant profiles of the sites, that each sampling point or each site is relatively consistent through these different sampling periods. When we look at 2015, we see a moderately supported cluster for a reference site here. We really see no um, well-supported or moderately supported clusters for these two mixed-use sites. So, Overall, what we're seeing here is generally unique contaminant profiles between these sites. And I like to point out that in areas where we have unique land use, we see unique contaminant profiles. Over here, where we don't really have unique land use, we don't see unique contaminant profiles. So this is at least consistent with this landscape framework, right? I can't really say it supports any specific hypothesis because we don't have really replication, right? We have one ag site one wastewater site. So I can't say that this contaminant profile is indicative of agriculture. It could be the uniqueness of that site for whatever reason. Um, but this is at least consistent with that framework. And so, you know, I think the, the most important thing here is that we do have variation between these sites. So having identified this variation, we can expose the organisms and see if we also get unique biological impacts from these different contaminant profiles. And I'll start with these organismal level endpoints. One of the most surprising things we saw was a decrease in survivorship where uh, at this North River Ag site, by the end of the 21 day exposure, about half of the fish had died. And this is a relatively surprising finding and it's somewhat frustrating because we're in the Shenandoah because it has a history of fish kills. And we kind of captured this fish kill in our local laboratory under very controlled conditions. It's still pretty hard to establish what the, what the cause of this was. Uh, one thing we're, we're fairly confident this was not just uh, an, you know, an experimental whoopsie, right? Uh, these, these upstream ag fish are housed in the same mobile laboratory as the wastewater impacted fish. So the exposure conditions are virtually identical. So if it was like something like an introduced pathogen or something, really expect that to affect both of these sites since they're housed in the same lab. And this is also generally independent across tanks as well. There's a number of different tanks that were affected here. All right. So we saw this mortality, can't tell you exactly why, but we do have molecular data from day seven, which will at least give us some suggestions or some hypotheses <laughs> of what might have been going on inside these fish. All right, we measured gonadosomatic index. So this is just the ratio of the gonad weight to the total body weight. And we see suppression of this GSI at our ag site, at our wastewater site, at the mixed use site in the male fish, and we see suppression here as well at the ag site and at the wastewater site in the female fish. So, um, gonadosomatic index is a good indication um, of endocrine disruption. Something has impacted these fish along the HPG axis, the hypothalamus pituitary gonad axis, which, which generally controls these tissues. So, some evidence for endocrine disruption here. We also look at the number of nuptial tubercles. These are these 
little white dots on the snout of the male fish. This is a secondary sex characteristic, also controlled by the HPG axis. And we see fairly significant suppression of these nuptial tubercles at the wastewater impacted site here. So these two endpoints together present a fairly strong case for endocrine disruption at these sites. And this is really what we expected to see given the history of these watersheds, and these are you know, our most impacted sites that we predicted. So this is you know, going all according to plan so far. However, if we look at some of this molecular data, here we have the concentration of the telogenin protein. So the telogenin is an egg yolk precursor protein that the females express as they get ready to spawn. And it's generally not expressed or only very lowly expressed in male fish. So it functions as a very good biomarker for exposure to estrogens. When male fish are exposed to estrogenic contaminants, they start expressing this VGG protein. What we see in the ELISA is no induction of metallogenin relative to our initial controls here. And we actually see suppression of the wastewater plant, which is the site that showed the, the, also the biggest suppression of these organism level points. So overall, this metallogenin tells us this is probably not an estrogenic mechanism of action. It's some other cellular mechanism or perhaps multiple probably multiple mechanisms um, are resulting in that organism line point. And this is, uh, so, oh, sorry, before I get to that, plasma metallogenin from 2015, again, no strong induction of metallogenin at any of the sites. And this is also corroborated by data from the microarrays. So we pull out a subset of transcripts that we have specific hypotheses about. So we pull these out ahead of time. These are uh, reproduction related genes controlled along the HPG axis, so estrogen receptors, androgen receptor, and two of our metallogenin isoforms here. Now looking at transcript instead of protein. And uh, we know that these are also responsive to exposure to estrogens. Again, we don't see any differential expression of these biomarkers at least in the sites where we had those organismal level impacts. We do have this little uptick in BTG, actually at our reference site. Um, the magnitude of this is really relatively small for metallogenin. When you see metallogenin induction, it's usually on the order of 100-fold, even 1,000-fold induction. It really gets ramped up. So this um, might be worthy of a closer look, but it also could just be background fluctuation expression of that protein. Overall, this is telling us, again, no evidence for an estrogenic mechanism of action. So we might need to look at some other potential explanations. Another group of genes that we pulled out that we had hypotheses for ahead of time are genes in the feral hydrocarbon receptor pathway. This is a part of a detoxification pathway. And it's known to be responsive to exposure to a variety of different contaminants, things like dioxins and PCBs. Down here, we see an upregulation of the cytochrome P450-1A1 gene. This is an enzyme that is regulated by the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So upregulation here indicates that we have some aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonists. Uh, if we look at the chemistry, we do find some known AHR agonists, things like diuron, phenol, carbamazepine, and some of the phytoestrogens. So, this might be a mechanism that's contributing to some of these organismal impacts. And you know, we also know that there's a lot of crosstalk between AHR and estrogen receptor pathways. And so it's just basically kind of a reminder to us in general that there are multiple pathways that can be, can be affected here. And that when we start messing with multiple pathways at the same time, we're gonna get complex organismal effects. Okay, so I just showed you some of the transcript data. Those are kind of looking at individual genes that we pulled out of the microarray ahead of time because we know they're environmental contaminant biomarkers. Some of the more uh, holistic analyses that we do with the transcript of data, just to talk about the data itself, we use 
Agilent 60K fab in on my grids. So we're getting 60 data points off of every, sorry, 60,000 data points off of every individual. And that represents about 22,000 unique genes that had in the genome. And we can do a couple different levels of analysis with this data. We can identify differentially expressed genes, individual genes like I've been talking about using the ANOVA. But we can also identify differentially expressed pathways and subnetworks. So we take a group of genes that we know are involved in the same molecular pathway, maybe the same overall biological process, and we can ask, is that group of genes as a whole up or down regulated in our exposure payment? This gives us a lot better biological context for interpreting these effects rather than just trying to look at a big list of individual genes and uh, tell a story about it. And then we can also look, uh, use clustering analyses to look at these overall patterns, transcription between the sites. So looking at our differentially expressed pathways, right? We do this analysis and we get a list of differentially expressed pathways. And then we group that list in kind of these categories of large scale biological function and see what things appear to be popping out of the data. So we see lipid-related pathways, things like lipid metabolism, storage, transport, are differentially regulated, and that pops up everywhere we look. This is differentially regulated relative to our reference site. We see that at all of these impacted sites in both years. And we go look at the literature at other complex mixture exposures that have used um, transcriptomic analysis, we see this pops up all the time, and it pops up regardless of what the specific exposure was. So whether it's wastewater, whether it's ag or urban, we see changes to limits. So this suggests that this is probably more of a generalized stress response to different aspects of these exposures, that it's um, altering their energetic regime a little bit, changing the way they process limits. Given how frequently it shows up, regardless of what the source is, likely that it's not necessarily a specific pathway level perturbation that we're seeing. We also see changes to immune related pathways. At our ag site in 2014, those pathways were largely down regulated. And then at the South Fork mixed use site in both of our years, we get uh, actually a lot of up regulation of these immune pathways. Talk about this North River ag site for a second. Pull out a couple of these individual pathways. These are the most strongly down regulated pathways at this site. They're involved in immune functions. So here we have the inter, interligin 6 signaling pathway and the classical complement pathway. So these are all the individual genes that make up this pathway. Green means they were down regulated in our transcript data set, red means they're upregulated, and this <laughs> pathway as a whole was significantly downregulated here. We see these two, these are really the strongest pathways that came out in terms of their the median fold change here. They're involved in pathogen resistance and as this North River ag site where we saw the increase in mortality. So this at least gives us a hypothesis that and maybe immunosuppression was involved in that fish dial. And that has, you know, there is evidence in the wild fish that immunosuppression is going on in these organisms. All right. And finally, we look at all of the differentially expressed genes and do another hierarchical clustering analysis. Uh, we see again the general pattern of clustering according to the site. Here, it's not necessarily that surprising because we did use the differentially expressed genes. So we chose genes that varied between sites and then we clustered them together. So we kind of forced that a little bit. But we do see in 2015 that again, at these mixed use sites, we don't see any clustering between these mixed use sites. We still get a pretty good cluster here on our reference fish, but these, these transcriptomes appear to be more similar to each other in some ways. Okay, so again, consistent with our landscape framework, where at sites where we have unique land use, we see unique exposure effects. At sites where there's little difference in land use, we don't see 
much of a difference. Still a little bit hand wavy, but we really use this as a proof of concept rather than this landscape plan. There are variations in both the, the contaminants that we see here and the effects of exposure. And then from here, we've actually done some additional experiments to get, uh, you know, use a little bit more statistically rigorous framework to get at this predicted value of the landscape. So, um, in conclusion, right, we see site specific contaminant profiles. Exposure to those site specific contaminant profiles produces site specific biological effects. And we see some you know, adverse outcomes following exposure to these waters. So there is risk there to the, the organisms. We're seeing things like you know, survivorship, of course, but also decrease in these, these organismal level endpoints. Um, it's something that we should definitely be paying a little bit more attention to. The strongest effects we saw were at the wastewater impacted and at the ag sites. Again, there's no real replication there, so maybe it's just the peculiarities of those individual sites. In 2016, we do have an additional wastewater and additional ag sites. So we get to see you know, how consistent this is um, across sites. All right, so that's what I got for chapter one. Moving on to some of these uh, future directions that I'll be working on uh, to hopefully get a PhD at some point. <laughs> uh, chapter two um, is really a technical update to the fathead minnow microarray. To explain what I'm doing here, just go into a little bit of the background of how microarray works. Um, so on a microarray slide, we have these short oligonucleotide sequences that are covalently bound to the slide. These are our probes. And so uh, at an individual spot on this microarray, we have a forest of thousands of identical sequences. We take our sample and we label it with the fluorophore, and then we allow that to hybridize on the array. So when we get complementarity between our sample probes, we get base pairing, and that fluorescent sample gets bound to the slide. We wash the slide off so anything that's not bound goes down the drain, and then we measure fluorescence at all of these different spots. And we can use that to estimate the abundance of uh, the transcript in the sample. Uh, okay, so that's technically how we measure these things. Then our interpretation of that really depends on knowing what this sequence corresponds to. So when we're when people are designing these microarrays, they go into the fathead menu and they find all of these mRNA sequences that are transcribed, and they take short chunks of those mRNA sequences and align them to reference genomes. So generally the zebrafish genome in this case. And where these probe sequences align to well-characterized annotated genes, then we assign that gene function to that probe sequence. And that way we know kind of what gene is this, what protein, and what is the biological function of that protein. So we have that annotation for most of the probes. However, there's always some that don't align well, and so we don't necessarily know what those probes represent biologically. And that information generally gets filtered out in the analysis of these microarrays. Um, but we're always learning new information about what genes do, and these databases that we use to find these reference sequences are constantly being updated. So this microarray was developed in 2014, so it's getting to be about five years old since the annotation was done. And uh, I did a preliminary analysis which showed that about 30% of the unannotated probes on the array are now aligning to an annotated gene model, so we know what that function is. So go back, re-annotate the array, and now we're getting more information about these effects of exposure um, every time we do these micro studies. So we can use that moving forward. We can also look backward and see all of these micro studies have already been done, and this data is available in the gene expression omnibus. And um, so we can pull out these studies and look for differentially expressed probes that were previously unannotated. So that information was just kind of filtered out 
in the analysis. We can look at specific types of exposures and see are we consistently seeing these probes up or down regularly. And that really represents an effective exposure that hasn't been categorized or talked about that may be important. So I'm going to do this for all the exposures to estradiol and ethenyl estradiol, which are model estrogens. So if we find these probes that are consistently up or down regulated in these E2, E2 experiments, this is going to add to our understanding of the mechanisms involved in exposure to these contaminants in fish. The same thing for wastewater effluents. They're interesting, and there's a lot of effluent exposures that have been done with fat head minutes. Right, so that's chapter two. Chapter three, we're getting back to our exposure data from the Shenandoah. And here, we're trying to establish correlation or an association between our chemistry and our biological effects, and in that way, identify the contaminants that are most likely causally responsible for these effects. So we have this long list of contaminants, this long list of differentially expressed genes. Can we correlate those two things and at least narrow down the list of potential causal agents here? The two different analyses that I'm going to use, an hypothesis testing approach and more data-driven, unsupervised approach here. Okay, for the hypothesis testing approach, uh, we're going to use the comparative toxicogenomics database and this has curated chemical gene interactions for thousands of exposure studies. So for every chemical that's detected in an exposure site, I will go in and download the list of genes that are associated with that contaminant in the database. Right, so here's that for the antibiotic sulfamethoxazole. All of these genes have been shown to be differentially regulated following exposure to this contaminant in a laboratory. And this represents our hypothesis for this specific contaminant, right? If this contaminant is causing biological effects, we expect to see these genes differentially regulated in the organism. And so I can use gene set enrichment analysis to test that hypothesis. Are these genes significantly up or down regulated in our exposure data, All right? So all of those contaminants that show significant enrichment using the GSEA, GSEA will be used to create our candidate contaminant list. All right, the data-driven approach, uh, we're just going to identify correlations using mutual information. So this is analogous to a correlation coefficient, uh, except it doesn't uh, assume linearity or distributional assumptions. Here, but it tells us how much of one variable, how much variation in one variable we can predict based on our other known variables. So in this case, how much of the variation in gene expression can be predicted from the chemistry data. So estimate the mutual information for all of the contaminant gene pairs in the data set. And then we will use that to build a network where we link contaminants to genes when there is high mutual information between them. And then we can do some network analysis to try and find the contaminants that are most likely, most likely to be causing exposure effects. So, I mean, the most simple one we can do is just identify the degree in the network for an individual contaminant. So, how many significant gene contaminant links are there here? Um, there's some other analysis that we could do here that might be able to get at more of the biological mechanisms that are occurring. If we look at what genes are associated with the chemical, we can do another enrichment of those genes and look for biological processes that are up or down regulated or overrepresented, depending on what it for those genes. And potentially even identifying some contaminants that are at risk for exposure effects, right? Contaminants that act on the same genes uh, are likely to cause additivity or synergy in our exposure data. So we can identify uh, neighborhoods, something like this, in the network that are more strongly connected to each other than they are to the greater network. So here's a, a schematic or a flow chart of what we're going to do in chapter three. Ultimately, both of these analyses are going to produce 
lists that have been associated with a biological effect. We'll look at the intersection of those lists and identify lists of contaminants that are high priority for future research or can potentially guide you know, management and policy decisions based on this level and other toxic information that we have available to us. Okay, finally, chapter four. Now we're getting back to the landscape, back to the land use. And here, uh, we really want to ask, can we use uh, land use variables? Are they predictors of biological effects? So we did a slightly different experiment in 2016, where we took juvenile fat head minnows, and we took grab water samples from 17 sites throughout the Shenandoah, and we exposed the juvenile minnows to these water samples in the lab for 72 hours. We measure the chemistry of the water, and then we measure specific biomarkers in these whole organisms using qPCR. So this is like the opposite of the mobile lab study, um, as far as, uh, you know, nice and quick, we just get whole organism endpoints. We don't have nearly as much um, detail, but we can, you know, it's way less logistically complicated. So we can get way more sites on the landscape than we can with the mobile laboratories. Okay, so here now we're directly asking, are land use variables predictive of these biomarker responses? So we're going to build multiple regression models where the predictor variables are landscape metrics that we think might be important. So things like percent agriculture, density of animal feeding operations. We can calculate Accumulated wastewater ratio, so it basically tells us how much of the water in the stream is coming out of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so there's a number of variables that we can hypothesize might be predictive of these responses, build multiple models, and then use model selection to select the best performing ones. Um, and you know we're we, a little bit limited here. Like ideally, we would be able to build fairly complex models, right? That really represent our hypotheses or anything. Many of these landscape variables, ag, interacting with wastewater, or at least adding to wastewater impacts, but um, we just don't have that many sites, we only have 17 sites, so we can't estimate that many parameters. So probably keep this pretty simple, one or two parameter models here. Okay, that's my dissertation. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of the uh, collaborators that have contributed to this, so I wouldn't be able to have uh, any of this really rich data without all of these different agencies and academic institutions contributing, so thank you to those guys, and then I will open it up for questions. Yeah, Trace. For your last chapter, we were using juvenile fathead minnows. What's the importance of using juveniles in, in that particular experiment? Um, I mean, for us, it really um, has to do with the exposure scenario. Um, for adults, you need a lot of water to keep them alive for any period of time. For juveniles, you lose a lot less water. Um, that's really it. I mean, there's definitely developmental implications of the timing of the exposure um, that would be interesting to address. But for the purposes of this analysis, it's really just there that it could work well. Okay. Just so it's not so much that they're maybe more susceptible to chemical exposures than adults. I know you said that, that could be part of it, but that's not the main. The yeah, main I mean, there's, that, there's definitely that. implications of that, but that's not really what we're targeting for this analysis. Okay. Um, what do you guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, does uh, does EPA track all of those chemical contaminants you're looking at, or some portion of them, at different sites across the country? Um, there's no like rigorous regulatory monitoring on this stuff. Okay, so they don't even in that number, that 30,000 contaminants is really a new number that they were forced to track based on an update to uh, some legislation, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Before that, they didn't. They had this long list of chemicals that they knew were used at some point, but not necessarily which ones are active and which ones are inactive. But that's just saying, like, someone somewhere is using these contaminants. Yeah. It's not saying, where are they? But if you had one of your, like, high priority identified ones, and it was tracking some other geographic location, and you had one for the land use around that location, does EPA match up with the Shenandoah? 
like say it's an antibiotic okay. that you found as one of your high potential in chapter three. Yeah. Could you then go find if that's tracked somewhere else and compare, see if your model from Genova fits to that. that same pattern? Yes. It's falling out. Yeah, where where those data are available, we could potentially do that. But there's no yes, sure how much they nationwide do that. team monitoring stuff. Yeah. So for the hypothesis testing portion of chapter three, huh? does that how do you account for the complex mixtures? Because it seems like you may overlook effects that are like an artifact in that blind spot you started with, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that is still kind of a reductionist approach. We're saying this contaminant is gonna have this effect in isolation, right? It doesn't get at these mixture additive synergistic interactions. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that is just a potential limitation of, of that level of analysis. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, we can say, I can say that depending on the type of mixture, effects, right? there's a lot of different things that can happen, right? but if it's an additive mixture effect where the contaminants are kind of impacting the same physiology, same molecular mechanisms, then it would still be able to detect that potentially because those same genes are still going to be up or down. Just, just like if it's exactly. different, and that is the most, probably the most common type of mixture effect that you get okay. is that additivity. Um, but yeah, if they're working on different parts of the physiology, different tissues, different molecular pathways that are interacting, then yeah, I don't, I don't think that analysis would pick that up. But you're saying that's a minority of the complex mixture effects where like studying it as one chemical you would miss an effect, whereas if you have a combination, all of a sudden an effect appears that didn't, uh, <laughs> it didn't, didn't work in isolation. <laughs> Um, sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> He's just here for the sandwiches. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is, are you, you're saying that like when you're talking about these complex mixtures, that some of these are like chemical A has this effect and chemical B has the same effect when you add them, it's just even worse. But that there's a small minority where chemical A seems to do nothing on its own, B does nothing on its own, but in combination, all of a sudden an effect pops up. Um, not necessarily they do nothing on their own, but they have effects that tend to multiply rather than just add together. So you can have an effect, let's say, where one contaminant um, inhibits the regulation of, of enzymes, and those enzymes metabolize other contaminants, right? So if we inhibit this enzyme, then this contaminant still present. We know it has a toxic effect, but now that's going to be a multiplying toxic effect because it's being metabolized differently in the organism. I see. So that's kind of those synergistic. So you'd expect that network to still pick them up. It's just a matter of magnitude then, right? Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, kind of on the other end of the, the complex mixture um, problem, uh, do you all consider the potential for a complex to react in the environment or uh, to degrade um, and become something other than they can? That is when you try to figure out where these um, chemicals might have been coming from or what energies might be impacting the whole um, the population to extend. Yeah, um, we do consider that our contaminant list that we analyze includes you know things degradation byproducts that we know these contaminants are turning into in the environment. Um, but yeah, that is a, another layer of complexity that we can't necessarily completely account for that we, we know again does happen. Right? Contaminants interact uh, in the water themselves before they're even exposed to the water source. On that how do you filter in the CTV concentration of your data base to make an environmental development? Just because it could be applied in a, in a single chemical study in a laboratory organism, uh, doesn't mean it would be actually available to an animal in the environment, especially in the 
Yeah, um, I mean, at this point, that's just a limitation of that level of analysis. And there's a lot of, of noise that goes into that contaminant database. Right? Um, you know, just concentration of the contaminant is a big one there. A lot of these lab studies, they expose it to a very high concentration that's probably not going to be found in the environment. But that's, you know, I'd say this is just like, this is our first cut of this data. And this is one approach, and that's why we're, we're using multiple approaches and looking at the you know, intersection of these approaches. Yeah. Uh, for your re annotation of those unknown genes, huh? where are those coming from? Is it an updated zebrafish genome you know, or the other organisms? Yeah, I mean, we'll use, we'll use BLAST. Yeah. Fish genome and, and potentially some other fish genomes as well. There's no more questions. Thanks.